this was what was developing in the late 50s and 60s. And Multics was developed, a huge project, started and, and led in MIT, also involving lots of companies like GE and Honeywell. Bell Labs was involved until 1969. And then they, they left the project. Um, and Multics was actually doing lots and lots of really impressive things. So if you looked at what Multics was able to do in the 60s. You had an operating system that provided this process abstraction. You had virtual memory, so you had isolation of each process, and you could write your programs with a nice, clean memory model. You had dynamic linking, that you could combine programs and access other programs. You had a hierarchical file, file system, similar to what we have in Unix. It was entirely programmed in a high-level language, offered a, a very strong notion of security as well as a way to reconfigure itself. So if you had a disk that broke, you could plug in a new disk while it was still running, or you could add, a, add more memory or add a new disk. How are we doing today compared to Multics? The operating system that you're running on your laptop, which of these does it have? Does it have a process abstraction? So it provides a pretty good process abstraction. And it provides pretty good virtual memory and dynamic linking. I would guess all the, the operating systems all of you are running provide that. And a hierarchical file system. So at least those first four, we're doing OK on. We're at least caught up to what things were like in, in the mid-60s with Multics. What about entirely programmed in a high-level language? Are any of you running operating systems like that today? OK. So yeah, so high-level is, is a little subjective. Um, and I would define a high-level language as one where programmers can't arbitrarily access arbitrarily locations in memory. I think that's at least one requirement for a high-level language. Even if you allow C as a high-level language, which, which does not have that property, an awful lot of whether it's Windows or Linux or Mac OS that you're running um, is still programmed in assembly. So I'd say this is definitely not true of your OS today. It's also not providing, uh, it's providing some level of security, um, and we'll get into more details on security later and what, what Multics provided with multi-level security. But uh, I would guess none of you are, are running OSs that provide as much as Multics did. And mostly not providing online reconfiguration. It's getting a little better that you can you know, plug in a USB device without rebooting. But anything like adding more memory to your machine definitely requires a reboot. If you're running Windows, even installing software tends to require a reboot. Um, so certainly Nothing like, like what Multics was able to do in the 60s. OK, so it seems like we're done with our story, 1969. We've got Multics. It's got um, all the important things that we have in our operating systems today, as well as some things we don't quite yet have. So why are we not done with our story? Because Unix ha OK, so why did Unix happen? Why were people not happy with Multics? Yeah, slow. Um, well, so certainly everything, relative to what we're used to today, everything was slow because computers were slow compared to today. But they get faster without needing to do anything. So yeah, I mean, some people need to do anything. But uh, needing something simpler is, is definitely getting at the, the answer. And the reason you needed something simpler was, was not necessarily, yeah, I don't think it was so much that so much of the code was error recovery. It was really how much memory you needed to run Multics. So if you wanted to run Multics in 1969, you needed what was then a, a really obscene amount of memory. You needed over 100 kilobytes. Back in 1969, cost you many millions of dollars. And I wouldn't take the 3.5 million there too seriously, because adjusting for inflation and things, it probably is more like you know, a $100 million equivalent today. Right? You needed to be either the federal government or someone who was being contracted by the federal government to be able to afford this. In order to have operating systems that people who were not that rich could use, you couldn't run Multics. And in 1969, there were, it was a team at Bell Labs. So Bell Labs had been part of the Multics project originally. By the late 60s, computers got cheap enough that there were sort of old, low-end computers that individual researchers could actually get their hands on. And two researchers at Bell Labs were Ken, not Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, who had, had experience working on Multics. And they got their hands on a PDP-7 which had eight kilobytes of memory. So pretty good for the 1960s, not the hundreds of kilobytes that you needed to run Multics. And this kind of machine would cost you know, more than you know, typical individuals could pay. But if you were a telephone monopoly, you could afford to have a few of these for your researchers to play with. And they wanted to play games on this computer, so they needed 
an operating system. And they wanted something in Multics, but Multics was far too big to fit on this machine. So they invented Unix. Talked about all the things Multics had that were good. To make it fit on this small machine, they had to give most of these up. So the one they kept, they definitely kept the process abstraction. That seemed essential. If you want a system that's going to be programmable in any sensible way, you've got to provide an abstraction of processes. They didn't have virtual memory. They didn't have dynamic linking. They did have a hierarchical file, file system. And the file system that we use today is not that different from what they were using in the late 60s, early 70s. Multics was programmed in PL, PL1, which is even a, according to my sort of stricter definition that excludes C, a high level language. They couldn't run that on, Unix, on their machine. It took far too much memory. The closest language that was available was a language um, called B that evolved from BCPL. That was also too big. That didn't fit in their memory. The other language that was, was very popular was Algol, which also was too big and complicated. So none of these languages that were the prevailing language at the time were simple enough that you could run a compiler on such a small machine. So they ended up inventing a variant, you know, developing a new language, which was C, right, which is what is still used for, for most, uh, most of the operating systems that you are running today. But most of the code was actually in assembly. Uh, not too much of the, the underlying OS code was written in C yet. Um, and C was designed to be small enough that they could fit it onto this low-powered machine they had. They didn't have any security. This was for them to play around and play games on, so it didn't seem important. And since they really didn't care too much about online reconfiguration, you just had to reboot if you wanted to change anything. Right, so this is what they ended up producing as Unix. And it had this great property that, well, you could run it on a machine costing a few tens of thousands of dollars instead of needing tens of millions of dollars. The other thing that really made Unix successful was they actually provided the source code. This was, um, so, so Grace Hopper actually started open source. Doesn't always get credit for this, but she started a movement of people sharing source code. But it was still very rare in the 60s and 70s for people to share, share source code. And at and decided to make the source code for Unix available to universities. It was not on the kind of open source license that allows you to, to modify and, and do other things with source code like you can under um, uh, like an MIT or Apache license. But it was made available. And the real reason for this was because at and couldn't make any money from it. So at and had a telephone monopoly. They were under very strict antitrust rules from the government. They weren't allowed to go into the computer business. So even though they sort of thought, well, maybe this is something we can make money from, they weren't allowed to. So that's why they give it away and let people get the source code. So universities had access to the source code, so lots of people started using this. Um, there was a, a famous book that John Lyons wrote that basically walked you through the source code. And you can still get, get this online today. There's uh, a course at MIT, the graduate OS course, that basically goes, still uses a, a variant of this. This was you know, doing well through the 70s. Um, Unix was spreading, um, and C was spreading mostly because of this availability that, that had happened. Then you know, things changed a little bit with at and they changed their, their uh, consent decree with the government, and they started to have a chance to get in the computer business and thinking that they could make some money from this and started placing restrictions and telling universities they couldn't use the Unix source code anymore. So this led Andy Tenenbaum to make an, a new version of Unix or an operating system inspired by Unix that didn't use any of the at and source code. He published a book in 1987 that included the source code for this new operating system which was called Minix, that mimicked a lot of things Unix did, but didn't have any of the encumbered at and source code. It was still copyrighted. Um, it was intended as, as an operating system, mostly for, for students to learn about operating systems, but was copyrighted. One of the students who started using Minix was mentioned at the beginning was, was Linus Torvalds in Finland. Linus decided he wanted to write his own operating system based on some of the ideas in Minix, um, and this was sent you know, to the Minix mailing list, but unencumbered by the copyright restrictions on the Minix code, and that would run on what were then reasonably cheap IBM PC compatibles. So this was 1991, so we're getting around the time when some, when were you born? 
Yeah, probably before most of you were born, so, right? Around the time when you were born. So not that ancient history. There's a, a interesting email dialogue around that time between Andy Tenenbaum and Linus about how bad the design is. So we talked about you know, the supervisor, right? So we have one program that's special. That's the kernel or the supervisor that has access to all the machine resources and runs with special privileges. And this quoted email is, is from Tenenbaum complaining that Linux is designed to have a monolithic kernel. So to have a huge amount of the code running with special privileges. That is good that he wasn't his student because that would definitely deserve a bad grade in 1991. It was already well understood that you wanted to keep the amount of code that has special privileges small. Why would you want to keep the amount of code that has special privileges small? OK, good. Yeah, so if you have smaller code, it's more likely to be correct, less likely to break. Is there a particular reason you really want the kernel to be small? It has access to the whole machine. It doesn't have memory isolation. right? So any bug in the kernel means it could potentially bash any memory of any other program. So you really want the kernel code to be correct. And keeping it small is one way to make it correct. So at least from, from a sort of good design standards by 1991, uh, Linux was not a good design. But Torvalds was OK with not getting good grades from uh, any 10 months because he wasn't in his class. Um, and Linux ended up being, being very successful. This fact that it was designed with a big kernel seems to have not prevented it from being successful. The fact that it was open and cheap and available and licensed the way it was made it, made it very successful. And there's a lot of things about the community that were also part of that. We're getting pretty close to our first Android install. 1993, we've got an open source OS, runs on cheap machines. Not cheap enough to carry around in your pocket yet, but that's really just normal uh, expected progress of hardware development. And this is where Android comes in. So Android is built on Linux. This is sort of the, the design of Android. The important kernel part of it is all based on a Linux kernel. There's a lot that runs on top of that. Right? So in sort of normal use, when people talk about operating systems, includes lots of things that are not part of the kernel. It includes programs like the web browser, right? which are not really part of the operating system, but they're part of what you get pre-installed on an Android device. They don't run with any special privileges. Some, some of the things at this level are, are running with at least, you know, there, there's a, a lot more complexity in terms of what level of special privileges you have. Right? So an Android app that's running in the Android runtime doesn't have access to resources without going through the libraries in the Android runtime. But the only part that has access to the whole machine is what's in the kernel. That's what's running with supervisor privileges. And all of that code. Um, yeah, there, there's lots of custom code that was added to Android, but all of it was based on what was, what was Linux. So we got to a billion activations five years later. And the one point I want to make of the story, other than hopefully getting the two technical things across, that hopefully everyone should understand what the process abstraction means and what a kernel is, that we tend to think of evolution, whether it's evolution leading to Android or leading to humans, as being sort of this path towards some desired goal, that it's sort of inevitable how things end up. And it's really not, right? There's tons of little events that happened that led to where we are. And I think lots of things could have happened differently. Lots of things that seem inevitable today probably will be very different five years from now. How long do you think we'll have to wait for the next billion Android installs? Yeah, maybe a, a year or two. Definitely not five years. There, there could be by the end of, uh, end of 2014, the second billion installs. Maybe it will get into to 21. The more interesting question is sort of what's the next platform? What do people, well, so, so the next, so, so uh, I, I should clarify. So I, iOS, iPhone will probably hit a billion sometime in, in 2014. What's, what's the next platform that isn't already widely distributed that's going to hit a billion installs? I, OK, this is the Samsung mobile phone. So, so that's got a, a shot. I guess we've heard of it now, so it's not, it's not eligible for the next one we haven't heard of. I guess no answer can be correct based on defining it as one we haven't yet heard of. But that, that's got a, at least a lot of resources and a big company behind it. And it is somewhat based on Linux, I believe. Uh, as what, you know, iOS is also based on Linux. So all of these are sort of Linux-derived platforms that are you know, maybe more than just Android and iOS will hit a billion, but they're still all Linux-derived. Um, so I don't know what the, the next platform that will hit a billion. My hope is there will be some platform that is not derived from Linux that will hit a billion devices within five years. And it's probably not something anyone has heard of today. But it seems kind of depressing to me that the, you know, the platforms that are all hitting a billion are based on this OS that was created 
in the late 60s because you couldn't run a proper OS on the cheap computers that they had at Bell Labs then. It seems like we should be able to do better. It's a very interesting time in operating systems. There's a, a lot of progress being done. I had this, this same bet last semester, and no one took me up on it. So I haven't reduced the time. So it's five years from now, not five years from, from last semester. But I believe that there, there at least I, I very much hope, and I think I believe that there will be some system with a billion devices running on it that no one's heard of to today within five years. And I would encourage all of you to, to be the one that creates that platform, because if you create the, the billion user platform, you have a pretty big impact. <laughs>